Welcome to the Bigger Cash Flow Podcast, where we interview business owners and real estate investors that share tips and tricks on how to grow your cash flow and reach financial freedom. What's up, you guys? Welcome to another exciting episode of the Bigger Cash Flow Podcast. Today's guest is Sunitha Rao. Ten years ago, she retired from a decade of playing tennis professionally at the age of 23 with a sixth grade education. Quite literally, no money and very little knowledge of how the world worked outside of her sport. Fast forward to today, she has earned a bachelor's in business and finance from Babson College, has an MBA, no student debt, a successful career in corporate finance, and a budding real estate business with six doors in her portfolio. With that said, let's welcome Sunitha to the show. How's it going? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for coming on. You know, we connected a couple months back and we got to know each other a little bit over the phone. Uh, Hearing about your background, I really resonated about how you approached money, um, got into uh, the world of finance, as well as real estate. So I'm really excited to bring your show uh, story to the show and share it with our listeners. I'm super excited to share it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. Why don't we just dive right in? And if you can tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and what you currently do to uh, create cash flow. Sure. So right now, I live in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I moved here about six months ago from Boston. I have a job, a corporate job in financial planning and analysis um, for a biopharma firm. Um, This is a job that I had when I was in Boston and um, was able to keep it and move to Indiana and work essentially remotely, which has been really great for uh, my flexibility and trying to also build my business on the side. So I do have that job and that job supports basically the growth, for the most part, the growth of my real estate portfolio, which I started building when I was still living in Boston. Um, I started investing, like my first purchase was about a year and a half ago. Um, It was a long distance investment, which was very stressful. (laughs) Um, You know, it's always hard when you're trying to kind of move money that you have worked very hard to earn and to save to a location you haven't been to and um, kind of are placing blind faith in whatever resources you had to educate yourself and your team and your own ability, I guess, to, to, to judge the situation. Um, so I did start investing about a year and a half ago. All of my properties were um, in Indianapolis. They still are in Indianapolis. And that was what really facilitated my move out here. Um, I really, I liked, I liked the area when I, when I visited, but I really wanted to grow my cash flow, grow my portfolio, grow my business as quickly as possible. And for me, that meant going all in and I had the ability to work remotely, which, which was just absolutely fantastic. So that's when I moved out here and <laughs> moving out here also was actually helpful for my cash flow from like the W2 perspective, you know, the cost of living in Indianapolis is vast vastly vastly lower than living in Boston Um, taxes are better it's just it's been a really good situation for me to set myself up for my future yeah no I love that and you said a lot over there so we want to unpack that uh, one by (laughs) one so taking a little step back you know in your bio I've mentioned that you were playing sports professionally so tell me about that transition from going from playing sports into where you are now that was frankly a very difficult transition and that was very difficult because of decisions that were made earlier in my life. Um, so I'm Indian. Um, unlike the paths of many Indians, education wasn't, education was important, but it wasn't the main goal. The main goal was, was succeeding in my sport. So I, as you, um, say in my bio, I dropped out of school very young. I, left school after formal education after sixth grade. I was supposed to be homeschooled, but I was training eight, nine hours a day at like 13 years old. So I wasn't really 
able to study or had the energy to study or no one really paid attention to what I was studying. So I kind of did it. <laughs> I, mean, I was 13, you know? So um, those decisions that were made made my life very, much more difficult um, when I needed to transition into the normal world. When my, while my ten, although my tennis career was successful, um, it didn't have the lifelong positive monetary impact that I think everyone had hoped. Mm. You know, so instead of dropping out of school and then being able to live off my earnings for the rest of my life, I found myself in a position where I didn't have those earnings. I left with when I retired, I think I had somewhere between one and three thousand dollars in my bank account and um, like really no skill set other than being able to to maybe teach tennis, but even players don't make good teachers, you know, so really not much of a skill set um, to rely on. But like, even though education wasn't highly, um, I guess, supported or highly prioritized, it was something that I really wanted, you know, maybe because it was so different from the life that I knew, but I just really wanted to succeed um, using my, my mind as opposed to my physical skill sets that I had gained muscle memory and et cetera. Um, so at that point, that was when I decided I needed to, when I retired, I decided I needed to go back to college. Um, and I, the only school I could get into was my local community college. Right. So um, it's not like many state universities are, are accepting sixth grade dropouts of GED. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, I went back to college, spent like two years just working around the clock, teaching tennis, from 6 a.m. to like 3 p.m., heading to a bar to bartend from like open 5, 6 p.m. until 3 a.m. and then taking classes on the side just so that I could build up some credibility. I networked my way after that. I networked my way into a private um, college up in Boston, Boston College, and was able to get um, scholarships and funds to cover to cover my entire education. Such a lucky, such a lucky break for me. So like my cash position coming out of undergrad was actually pretty decent. Get, actually not pretty decent, very fortunate given the educational landscape that many students face today. You know, I, I left without any student debt. I mean, I didn't have any savings really left, but no debt is, is you can't, you can't beat that situation. Right. Yeah. So after that, um, I had a couple of options for jobs, um, but I decided on the option that I felt like would be the best long-term fit, help me, help me kind of increase um, my upward mobility. So accepted a position at a Fortune 500 company where I was in their management training program. Um, and that was awesome for a while. It was fantastic. Like great exposure, a ton of training. My pay wasn't great, but I was kind of that was the trade-off for all the exposure and learning and everything. Um, and I was so dedicated. Like that was what I finally wanted. You know, I had a stable paycheck. I had a future where I didn't have to worry about money and all of this stuff. And I just gave it everything I had. I worked like nights, weekends, did whatever people asked of me. And then, and then some, I was on like all these like committees for like diversity and inclusion and doing, leading all these initiatives. Just, I was all in. I think as many people realize sometimes when you're at a company, um, you can be all in, but like there are other things that lead to success. And I think um, I started to realize that the corporate life, certain companies wouldn't be the best fit, you know, and I, the, that company I was at wasn't because even though I was trying very hard and I felt I was adding tremendous value, I guess maybe you feel the same, you know, <laughs> so a couple of things happened where I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I am all in on this one thing, like that is completely, that is setting the constraints for the most important things in my life, which are time and money, mm -hmm. which influence basically all the decisions I have to make about my lifestyle and I'm giving them everything I've got and I'm not getting what I need in return, mm -hmm. you know? And that moment, it was kind of a rough moment because it very much paralleled experiences I'd had in my childhood. So I grew up, my parents were immigrants. Um, they were not well off um, for much of our 
much of our lives. But the biggest, and, the, and while that was a stressor, the biggest stressor was the fact that the dynamic in my household was abusive. So my mother had relied on my father as her single source for her financial and economic well-being, right? And that didn't pan out very well, clearly. Um, and even though all those years later, I was in a much better situation. You know, I, I was employed. I had a great job. I was free. I was safe, you know, but having to still rely on that one source that could control everything, that parallel was similar enough to me to say, okay, this isn't okay. You know, like a job is great, but I need to diversify so that if any one thing happens in any like pillar of my life that I'm reliant on economically or financially, I can still be okay and recover if one falls or if one doesn't pan out. Right. So that was when I started looking into different aspects of personal finance. I wanted to take control of my own future and influence it to the greatest degree possible. Um, looked at a whole bunch of things, stocks, like travel hacking, <laughs> couponing. <laughs> like it sounds so silly now, but I didn't know where to start. You know, eventually I found real estate. And so I chose real estate because it closely mirrored what I needed from my own risk tolerance and um, what I needed, my, my, uh, my attitude towards money, basically. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, just listening to your story, it's, it's pretty an amazing journey that you've had going from playing sports professionally and very similar to what you shared in the latter part with, you know, your Fortune 500 job and you realized you kind of were running into this glass ceiling and you had to transition elsewhere uh, because you were all in and you were giving it your all, adding value. So it looks like you had also a similar experience playing sports professionally. You know, you're giving it your all, you're trying to make it professionally and by the age of 23, you retired and you had little money um, and little sk skill sets per your words. Um, I I'd like to say that you probably had tremendous work ethic uh, that has you know driven you to where you are today. But you know the common theme was this: you know you faced you're giving it all in one area, and then you know you had to kind of start over and you had your cards stacked against you basically. But what's amazing to me is that it seems like you're very self-reflective, not which uh, many people are, and you're able to realize, hey, this is not right. I need to make a you know, decision, whether it be changing you know, jobs or maybe looking at different you know, ways to make money, whether it be couponing or travel hacking or real estate, <laughs> uh, to be able to take uh, control of your financial future, which is what this podcast is all about. You know, a lot of my listeners are probably you know, W-2 workers like me and you, and you know, listening to these stories, they might still be thinking, hey, you know, that's for Bo, that's for Sunitha, maybe I'll do it in five years, seven years, and still just do their 401k, Roth IRAs, which is still awesome. But you're also giving that control to somebody else instead of you taking yep. full control, which is something that I really want our listeners to take home with them today. So um, thanks so much for sharing that. Why don't we talk a little bit more about, you know, real estate, you were just getting into it. Um, how did you end up deciding on Indianapolis? And how did you first get started? Because that's the biggest hurdle that a lot of people have, they don't know where to start. There's so much information out there, bigger pockets, Facebook groups, and all these gurus, right? So how did you get started? Yeah. Um, so when I decided to jump in that I wanted to do real estate, I was working full time and I was in grad school. So I didn't, I really had no money to like invest, but I knew that was a temporary situation and not a permanent one. Right. So I figured I could use whatever time I had, which wasn't much, but whatever time I had to educate myself until I got to the point where I had saved enough money to invest, you know, and by the time I got to that point, I would be as well prepared as I possibly could be to be successful in that endeavor. So um, like so many other people, I turned to the internet, you know, read articles, listen to podcasts every living minute of the day um, and just did that. But also that self, that self reflection piece that you mentioned was absolutely critical because 
you need to understand what works for you, right? So like it's only whatever strategy you choose, however you want to go about building that cash flow and taking control of your life, it needs to fit with what your goal is at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. 10 years from now, what kind of life do you want to lead? What does that look like? How much money do you want? How much, how much stress do you want? Do you want to be doing something every day for this? Or do you want to have something that's more or less passive that you can spend a couple hours a month on? So like it's the first thing is to be really dialed in on what your goals are and what you want your future to look like. That's how you start. Okay. I, I love then it. after, <laughs> then after that, it comes, comes the education piece because, and if you, if you start with your goals and then you educate, you can, it's easier to throw out what doesn't fit for you. Right. So like I knew I wanted a passive income, passive in air quotations, right. Cause nothing is completely <laughs> passive, but it's, it wasn't, I didn't want an, yet another job, you know, and that was going to be a business that required the resources, the time resources of yet another job. How on earth was I going to be able to build that while working a full-time job? You know, so with that in mind, like I was able, when I started reading about different, different um, strategies, like I was able to throw out immediately, basically flipping. I don't want to flip. I don't have the time for that. Wholesaling. I don't want to be driving all day. I can't do that either. You know, so it's just like one at a time. And then that allows you to figure out exactly how you want to go about building your business. For me, the best option was long-term buy and hold at that time. So once I figured out, okay, doing the front end work now so that I can get an asset that will essentially pay me in perpetuity, basically forever, while still increasing in value over the long term, that is not easy, but it's the perfect fit for me. Because if I put in the work now, then later down the road, when I want to take a cruise for three months, or I have a family, like that's doing its thing. It's Mm -hmm. done. You Mm -hmm. know, I can, I can more or less chill. Um, so once I decided that, then it was like, okay, so which markets are going to work? Where, where do I invest that will give me the best chance to, to, to make this happen? And so living in Boston, holy cow, like (laughs) at that time, the Boston market, I mean, the Boston market is always expensive. It's always hot, but like, that's when, um, like the foreign investors were coming in. We had like a huge influx of Chinese investors coming in and buying property sight unseen, no inspection, over asking and in cash. As a W2 corporate employee, I don't exactly have a million dollars in cash sitting around that I can right. just throw at something mm-hmm. without knowing what on earth I'm buying. Yeah. You know? So that's when I started looking at other markets and started looking at like economic statistics that I saw would bode well for buy and hold investments. It included things like job growth, um, economic growth, both in the past and into the future, um, diversity of employment, that sort of thing, and kind of compare them to how the rest of the country was performing. Because, okay, great. You're looking at city A and it's growing 5% a year. That seems awesome. But what if the rest of the population is growing like 20% a year? I'm using exaggerated numbers. It's not keeping up with what should be happening in a country and I'm not comfortable buying an asset that I will want to be reliant reliant on in 10 years when I don't, when I hopefully don't have a job anymore. You know, I want that asset to be performing really well then, you know, so did this economic analysis over a bunch of different cities all over the country and um, came up with like a short list of cities. And that's when I started, I visited Kansas city, visited Indianapolis and then started trying to like network to find people to support it. And then at the end of the day, I found a really awesome property manager who I still work with today um, in Indianapolis. And that was like the cornerstone of like my team. I wanted someone really good to be involved in leading my day-to-day activities. And so once I had the shortlist, found the person, I was like, all right, India it is. Let's do it. <laughs> Love it. I'm going to kind of summarize that for our audience a little bit because Sunita has shared, you know, just dropped a ton of knowledge right now. She's I'm probably going to quote her a couple of times here, but one of the things that uh, she said that I, you know, caught my attention was I had no money after college, but I knew that that was a temporary situation and not a permanent one. And I think that type of mindset uh, and thinking is what's going to be critical if you're going to succeed in anything, especially in real estate, 
because it's not the, okay, I'm in this situation now. What do I do? And just stop. It's a growth mindset versus static. Exactly. Every time you hit a roadblock, if you're just thinking, okay, that's it. That's the end of the road. (laughs) Then you're not going to get anywhere. So you got to think about, you know, Brandon Turner on his podcast says, you know, not, you know, how can I do this? Right. Not, I don't have this. Right. So just changing Mm -hmm. your vocabulary like Sunitha did, um, I think that's going to provide tremendous value for you guys as well. So remember that. And also the fact is that Sunitha took the time to really think about her future. And I don't think a lot of us do that enough. Some of us might do it maybe once a year as, you know, we're wrapping up December, we set our new annual goals and whatnot. You know, and as you guys know from hearing uh, me on the podcast, what gets measured gets managed. So you guys have to keep track of that, not just once a year, maybe even quarterly or monthly if you're really pressing hard towards that goal. And you really have to take time to think about what you want. What's the lifestyle that you want? I had a call with an investor yesterday who just, you know, figured, okay, on the forums, on bigger pockets, a lot of people are buying, you know, after repair value, eighty, ninety thousand dollar homes. So I'm just gonna go buy it. So I started asking him questions, not to be mean or anything, but I'm just asking, okay, why do you want to buy those properties? Do you know what type of tenants you will attract in those uh, demographic neighborhoods? How much do you know about the area and things like that? And he really didn't know the answers to those questions, and that told me that he needed to take a step back and really you know, think about, you know, the area that he's going to invest in, why he's investing in, and what kind of lifestyle that's going to bring him. Because Sunita mentioned earlier, quote unquote, passive, it's really going to be different if you have 10 A-class rentals, you might cash flow much less at maybe, you know, four or 5% cap rate. But versus... Initially. Yeah. Initially. (laughs) But if you have a bunch of D-class rental, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm like Donald Trump. I'm making so much, you know, cash flow. (laughs) But then you realize you have evictions and, you know, all these other problems that might come out. I'm not general. I'm not trying to generalize here, but over the long term, what is the lifestyle that you want? So I just wanted Mm -hmm. to reemphasize that because Sunitha brought up such a good point. So Remember not to, you know, skate to where the puck is, but where it's going. Think about your future. Think about what kind of lifestyle you want and reverse engineer that. A lot of us reverse engineer everything else we want in life. Like if you want an education, you just don't show up to Babson College and be like, hey, can I get a degree? No, you have to think about- Yo, let me in. (laughs) Yeah, yo, let me in. No, you got to think about your finances. You got to think about logistically where you're going to live. You got to sign up for classes. You got to attend. You got to take those classes. You, there's steps to everything, right? But not a lot of people really reverse engineer our retirement and the lifestyle that we want. It's like, hey, if I just grind it out for 40 years, stash my money somewhere, I think I'm going to be able to retire. That's not going to be the case. So, you know, sorry for, you know, talking so long, but yeah, I just needed to share that. If I might add to that, like, I think one of the things that I see is that people kind of accept these paths that are set out to them. You know, it's get a good job, it's do this, but what's going to make you happy, you know? And this sounds so cheesy, but what if none of these things were a constraint? What if you were allowed to dream about the future that you wanted that would make you most happy? I mean, maybe this is like a byproduct of like my upbringing, but like if I never was had the ability to dream of a better future, I don't even know where I'd be today, honestly, like with the dynamics I grew up with, you know? And I really think people need to believe it's it's just so cheesy but it like believe in the power of their dreams and they like it can happen you just kind of have to figure out what that looks like and what that ideal scenario is and there's no reason people can't reach it right um what i see a lot of is like is the fear you know being conservative being scared you know being but fear fear is meant to keep you safe people use fear to keep themselves small not live like their biggest best dreams right so it's really trying to figure out what that difference is and educate the the antidote to the fear is the education so if you just put in the time and educate yourself you that fear can be overcome if you if you want a different life yeah i I love it yeah i just want to echo like 
you know, the, the lack of education is what makes you fearful. But if you take steps towards that goal and you, you know, you slowly stack it, right? I think I said on the show numerous times, go as far as the eye can see. And once you get there, you'll be able to see further. So you're not just starting out right away and say, Hey, I'm going to do 20 flips in Southeast Indianapolis right away. It's like you do that first flip, you know, what do you learn from it? Take those notes. You go to the second, third, you scale your business that way. It's incremental growth over a long period of time. So like Sunita says, you got to really think about what that's going to look like instead of just trying to jump the gun. If you're looking for insurance coverage for your rental properties, the company that I trust is Ross Diversified Insurance Services, a national insurance agency that has been providing insurance coverage for real estate investors for over 30 years. Whether it's a rental or a fix and flip, Ross provides you coverage through A-rated insurance carriers to provide you with competitive rates as one size does not fit all. Check out biggercashflow.com slash RDIS to get your free quote today. When you're purchasing your first property or the next, you want to work with an experienced lender who's got your best interest in mind. Sean Huss at Chemical Bank has been a professional in the mortgage industry for over 25 years and has helped hundreds of investors like you and me grow their rental portfolio. With expertise in areas such as real estate sales, title and escrow, and the mortgage closing process, Sean is able to provide comprehensive counsel to guide you throughout this often complicated process. Check out biggercashflow.com slash chemical bank to get pre-qualified for free when you mention the Bigger Cash Flow podcast. So um, you mentioned about you, you looked at the market, you know, you talked about at a high level, the population, the job, the economy, Mm -hmm. what that rental market would look like. Then you looked for your team. And I would agree that, you know, your property manager, um, your agent, contractor, lender, those, those core four that David Green talks about, that is going to be key. So once you set that up, um, how did you get your first deal? MLS. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. it goes against everything that we learn, like off market deals and stuff, but it was actually an awesome deal. Surprisingly, I mean, I think at the time, a lot of, no, I don't think I know at the time, a lot of what I was reading, you know, is, uh, was, people being interested in Indianapolis, especially like out of state investors, you know? And so Indianapolis, Indianapolis, like the city, but this property was actually in the suburbs, you know? And uh, again, you know, look at what your goals are as, as an individual. Most people were looking at cash flow, immediate cash flow, which is essentially projected cash flow, not necessarily what will actually happen, you know? So understanding like the nuances of the different class types and the different property types, um, that was really helpful and what allowed me to think differently. And I think find this one property. So it's, um, it's in, uh, I mean, it doesn't probably what matter to most of your listeners, but it's in Hamilton County. And that is the area where it has, where like some of the best schools are, you know, so like the crime rates lower, et cetera, et cetera. Um, more stable tenant base. And yeah, it wasn't the number, it wasn't like one of the $50,000 duplexes where you can charge 800 a side and like you're making three X, two and a half X the rent. But like, I've had a stable tenant in there for two years, you know, when I have another property in the same town that became open two days before school started, you know, which is like the worst time for someone who's banking on being in a good school system. But like that property was filled in two days, you know, like it's for me finding it in a good, it was, it's a solid B plus a minus area um, with decent numbers that I'm, I'm still making a profit off of it. You know, and I think it'll really be good long-term. That was kind of, that was kind of how I found the property and why I decided to invest in that location and in that property. I love it. And you mentioned earlier that, you know, you know, when I was talking about a class and C class and whatnot, you know, initially, so why don't we talk a little bit about your thoughts on the different classes and why you chose a better neighborhood with better schools? Sure. So this goes to what my end goal is. You know, I want to not have to worry about my tenants. Am I going to have to evict them tomorrow? 
are they going to smash a hole in one of the walls? I mean, that's always, that's always a risk you take, but people who want their kids in good school systems tend to want to have nice housing, tend to think long term, and they aren't quite as transient, you know, whereas people who are trying to get through like the day to day, which might be more of like your D class asset, they might not think as long term, you know, and also their incomes might not be higher. So if they take one hit, all of a sudden they can't pay rent, all of a sudden you have to go to court, you have to pay for like the lawyer's fees, you have to pay for this, you're out your income. If I am at a point in 10 years where like I have a family to support, I don't want to have to worry about whether I can support them and pay my own mortgage because one of my tenants can't pay theirs, you know? So my cash flow, I mean, I would argue that it's just as good because I was able to find a good deal as many of, uh, as many investments that are available right now. But, um, I was willing to give up a little bit of that in the front end to have a more dependable cash flow over time. And so that was one thing. But the other thing is with higher class assets, these people have jobs where the incomes increase, right? It's not like you're in a D class asset where someone's working retail at Target or at Taco Bell, where I mean, I'm not going to get into the whole like wage disparity in America like argument, but like their, their incomes may not increase over time, right? Mm -hmm. If you go with working professionals whose incomes will increase, you can more consistently raise rent, Mm -hmm. right? So even if you think you're not maybe getting the cash flow today, come back in a few years Mm -hmm. and being able to increase the rent again and again, year over year, that really adds up. So I think long term that can happen, which is very good. The other thing is property values, right? You get a fifty thousand dollar duplex in the inner city, mm-hmm. that that's you're getting what you're getting. You're not gonna get a ton of appreciation. Mm-hmm. If you look at the first asset that I bought, I recently went for a commercial refi. Um, it appraised fifty percent higher than my purchase value. Awesome. I bought it a year and a half ago. Awesome. So I'm using that to reinvest and buy more properties. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you buy correctly and good assets, there's no reason. This is me preaching. There's no reason to be investing in some of the, I think, the, some of the lower class assets. I think that just sets you up for stress and mm. potentially heartache. Yeah, no. And I love this perspective because the common perspective that I hear is that, you know, obviously you don't want to be at ends of either spectrum, like no, maybe A plus neighborhood or D minus D war zone, but you want to be at that B, C class area. And it looks like you picked a great area and you got some appreciation and your tenants has, you know, stayed longer because tenant turn is actually what really kills your cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. As our listeners may already know that, But, you know, like Sunitha mentioned, if you have more transient tenants in areas where school can just be considered an amenity, right? So I think of like, even if it's in a C-class area, maybe it doesn't have good schools, but if it has other amenities, maybe like a, you know, single person would just like, maybe they'll stay longer because I've had, you know, C-class properties where they, you know, just renew after year. Yeah. But, you know, it might be more, you know, common in areas where it's residential and they need a, you know, if a kid goes to school and they like that school elementary, that's six years, you know, high school, that's four years. So, you know, they're more likely to stay long-term. So I think thinking about that, and I also love what you mentioned about rents as well. So those things are, I think, really important, you know, and also the strategy is going to be different. If you're going to pick up, you know, a bunch of maybe C class, even, you know, D plus class, I know some people do that just to get like three times rent to value ratio and just bank on the cash flow and try to volume, like scale by volume. I know people who have like a hundred section eight homes in Kansas city uh, that just cash flow like crazy, but they also know about 20, 30% of their portfolio is going to give them a ton of headaches. So it's, it's a number yeah. thing for them. So just really make sure the reason why I'm, you know, reemphasizing this is really make sure what kind of lifestyle you want. If you're a working professional um, that has a nine to five and you're already 
busy with your day to day, you don't want another, you know, headache on your hands, right? So going Sunitha's route might be really beneficial. And this is literally a conversation that I had with somebody yesterday about this because they were thinking. I about, had the same conversation a week ago with someone who was looking at like a hundred plus units in as someone who isn't an investor, you know, and they kept mm-hmm. talking about the cash flow yep. of a hundred plus like D class units. And I was like, you don't want to go there. You have a family, you have a job, like, just trust me on this, you know? And I don't think they trusted me. Yeah. <laughs> I tried. Yeah. It really depends. It really depends on your risk tolerance. And I, for the people who can do it more power to them, we need people who can provide good housing in mm-hmm. these, in these classes. Yeah. And one thing I that I might, panic attack. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I would add to Sunita's strategy, which I personally like, is you know your Fannie Mae loan. So you got to think about your financing as well. And you have ten golden tickets, as I like to say. If you're married, you have twenty. So what kind of assets are you placing on these conventional thirty-year fixed, uh, fully amortizing loans? It's really going to be based on your strategy. But you know, do you want to put in you know hundred to two hundred thousand dollar assets that? are going to appreciate more. You're going to be able to increase rents. It's in nicer neighborhoods. Uh, You're going to have the best financing available. What are you going to put it on, uh, on those 10 tickets? So I think that's another consideration that you want to be thinking about, especially if you're not going to be doing this full time. If you're going to be picking up maybe one or two a year, um, it might behoove you to put these types of assets on your portfolio. Yeah, and I think the other thing that is really great about these assets is that it, it allows you options, you know? So if you get, we're back to the $50,000 duplex in the inner city, like who are you going, how are you going to optimize that? Who are you going to sell it to to exit? If you want to sell it, you're basically only going to sell it to another investor. So your, your resale value might not be the highest, right? Mm-hmm. And then also like if it's not in the best area, there's less demand. So like being up where I am, like I was able to turn in that, in that property, I was able to turn one of the units into an Airbnb because it's in a good area. You know, I can sell it retail because it's in a good area. People want to live there. Like there's just more options over time. You know, I think there's a place for C like C class assets. And at this point I wouldn't mind getting into some C class assets for some cash flow and some diversification. You can't always get into these higher priced assets. You need everything, you know, Mm -hmm. but uh, for especially for a new investor i would i would recommend not throwing this out as an option yep yep no i love it so why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about any personal finance tips or tricks that you got you have acquired over the years i'm sure there's many <laughs> i wish i had time to think about this in advance <laughs> <laughs> not to put you on the spot but yeah yeah <laughs> personal finance tips and tricks i think the biggest thing for me has been recording everything I spend and everything I make. So that allows me to project my income, mm-hmm. my net income, which will then allow me to figure out how much I can invest and in what I can support in the months to come. Yeah. That's been like the game changer for me. Do you have a budget tool to do that? Or is it just an Excel spreadsheet? It's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, they're like, I didn't build it. They're like, it was a template, but their macros built into it, which show you how much you're spending per category. Okay. Um, And that's, yeah, I, I really like that. It's definitely, it's more manual, but I like the manual piece because it keeps what I'm spending at front of mind and it just helps keep the importance of what I'm doing. Like it it doesn't get in my rear view mirror. It's still right in front of me. I remember it like, yeah, I, I recognize its impact more than if I was to use something like Mint, which is automatic, which I just look at later. And I'm like, oh, I've spent this much, you know? So. Yeah, no, I love it. It's it's constantly in front of you. Um, one of the realizations that I had in terms of like a light bulb moment was uh, you, you mentioned earlier, th- the reason why you're getting cash flow is like, hey, if I want to go travel or do whatever, you know, the steady... Um, you know, if I don't work, that's the active income, then the paychecks don't come in unless, you know, you're on PTO. But if, you know, the the cash flow is still coming in. And I had this realization after I bought my first two and I was in Hawaii with my wife and I was like, oh man, this cash flow, it's like really awesome. Like I I wasn't doing anything and we rented out um, one of the rooms as well. And that check was coming in and I was like, okay, that's what really triggered me to go ahead and do this like much more aggressively 
but you know you mentioned the budgeting and what i like about what scott trench says in his book and i'm dropping a lot of names and books that you guys should definitely check out and follow is in set for life that was one of the probably the first personal finance book that i read and it really talks about preparing yourself and setting yourself up for the future and being able to take risks right and once a lot of us are so in the whirlwind of living our w2 jobs and lives we really don't have time to think about the plus one that we need to go ahead and prepare for our financial future so you know what i love about what sunitha did was you know she looked at her educational expenses and br literally brought that down to zero she moved from you know boston to indianapolis where where her cost of living is much lower so she's really setting herself up to be able to use her um, income to be able to invest and it's going to be a cycle that's going to produce more passive income she's going to be able to buy more properties and i just wanted to highlight that there for the people who are trying to connect the dots in terms of why i should do this that's going to be really critical anything else to add on that sunitha I don't think so. I mean, uh, a lot of people look at money as like this big and, and like maybe investable, ca investable capital is like this big thing. But like mm -hmm. if you make small adjustments, it's easy in time to find ways to save more money to reinvest. You know, like, I mean, at this point, I'm, I think, I mean, I invest in like my four, my company 401k and stuff because they match. Mm -hmm. But um, at my like after my after um, payout, after tax, like savings rate is probably like 85% between like my house tax, like getting on a family plan with friends for my cell phone, like mm -hmm. paying off my car. Like if you just do little things, the long-term impact is, and reinvest it, the long-term impact is huge. Yeah. So I, this is why I love your story because I feel like it's so tangible for you know a lot of people. It's not like you have a thousand units and people are like, okay, I, I can't even dream of doing that or whatnot, which I don't think is true either. But with your story, you literally had to start from scratch at 23 and you're able to build this out. So I think it's very tangible, uh, which is why I love hearing your story. I'm probably repeating myself, but it's, it's such a great story. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. So we're near the end of our show. And before we wrap up, is there anything that you'd like to share with our bigger cash flow listeners? Um, I don't, I don't really think so. I think, I, I think I've talked a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you shared a lot of nuggets. So. Right now. <laughs> okay. So if our listeners want to learn more about you, how can they get in contact with you? Um, they can uh, go onto my website. I have um, a website for my portfolio. Um, it's called Griffiths Property Group. Um, and spelled G R I F F I X property group.com. Awesome. Does that mean anything? I'm just curious. <laughs> Actually, it does. I don't have, so I'm like such a nerd. So <laughs> I don't have like a clean narrative for this, but I really love mythological creatures okay. <laughs> and like the, the power that they have and like mm -hmm. giving people meaning to their lives, like throughout the centuries, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Griffiths is like the combination of like a griffin and a phoenix. So griffins are known to project, protect treasure and wealth, whereas phoenix, phoenixes, like they are reborn from negative events or like the tough times of their cyclical life, you know, which I think is really representative of real estate, right? Because real estate never goes up there. It goes up and then there's like the crash. And it's really important to have an entity that will protect wealth and the treasure that you've built up that will secure your future through good times and bad set it up so that it can be reborn and come back stronger after a negative event basically i, I love that you even took the time to think about that instead of going one two three main street a lot of people like think about what should I name my LLC? It's like, hey, just name it after the property. No, I think that's really awesome. It really shows that you kind of take time again to reflect and put care into what you do. So that is awesome. Thank you. Well, you know, if you enjoyed what we discussed on the show, please do me a favor and leave us a review on iTunes. We'll be right back here next week for another exciting episode of the Bigger Cash Flow Podcast.
Thank you for listening to the Bigger Cash Flow Podcast. Please remember that opinions of the guests are their own, and nothing on this show should be considered personal or professional advice. Please consult your tax, legal, or financial advisor for personal advice that fit your unique situation. See you next time. That is.